Hello. How's everyone doing? Welcome back to Computer Science 3200. Um, today, we have a really cool lecture. We're talking about assignment two. This is the big one. <laughs> this is the biggest assignment in the class, I would say, and probably the most amount of work. So hopefully you're ready for it. Uh, it's not overly complex, but there are a lot of parts. So it's might be the most work you've ever done for a single assignment in your computer science career so far. So, um, but I do think that the, the feedback that I have gotten from students on this assignment is that it's a lot of work, but you learn a lot and it's such a great feeling when you get it to work and you get the marks for this assignment. It's, it's really, really cool assignment. And I do think that you'll have a lot of fun with it, even though it might be a little bit annoying at first. Once you get the hang of it, it's going to be great. Okay. So, um, before I show the code and the user interface and stuff, um, so the user interface is going to be the same as assignment one, but it's it's got some more features. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But before we get to... Uh, actually, no, let, let's go through um, a few of the features for this assignment. So, as before... Um, if I click on a start and goal location, you are given this like L-shaped path. So obviously this is not correct, right? You have to modify that just like in assignment one. However, now there are a bunch of different um, solutions available. So there's student A star in which you have to implement the A star search algorithm. So just like you did BFS and DFS for assignment one, now you're implementing A star. There is the solution, A star. So if you click, click the solution, you can see the solution working in real time, okay? Um, if you select any of these other algorithms, you do not have to implement these algorithms at all. However, they're just there in case you want to see them, okay? So for example, you can compare uniform cost search and um, greedy best first search and all that. They are there, but the only thing you have to implement is A star. That's it. Other options um, are now we have different object sizes. So there's object sizes. Let me go to the solution code so you can see this. So an object uh, in the assignment one, we just had a one by one, so a size one object. Now we have a two by two as well as a three by three object. So this actually looks pretty cool if you're doing the, uh, the paths in real time. And the interesting thing about this is that now some paths that may have been possible are no longer possible when you increase the object size. So for example, if I want to pathfind from here over to here, I can take this one width path through this little maze here, but if I then increase the object size to two, I'll have to take the long way around. So I take this two width breadth, uh, this two width bridge. And then if I change this to three by three, well then it's no longer possible, okay? So that's the object sizes. There are also uh, different legal action, um, different legal actions available. So for example, here you have eight directions. So you can see that our paths are now going to be able to move in diagonals. But if I change this to four directions, then the path should just be in four directions, okay? And also we have uh, the ability to change our heuristic function for the A star search. And we'll talk about that when we get into that. And the rest is just the same. Oh, sorry. One other thing is different. If I refresh this, uh, right click a tile to see all the tiles that are connected to that tile. So if I select the solution here and then I right click, for example, on this tile, it shows you in purple all the tiles that are connected to that tile. What connected means is that there exists a legal path from this tile to all of the other purple tiles and none of the other tiles that aren't purple. So here, if I right click here, um, anywhere that I click, you can see where the um, paths are legal. And this takes in size. So for example, if I click three by three square and I click here, you're going to notice that there are some places that are blue because that this represents the purple tile is the top left tile of the three by three object. Similarly down here, um, if I right click here, these are the places that I can pathfind to with a three by three object from this location 
or if I hit down here or in here or up here, etc., etc. So this is the other thing that's new to this assignment is computing what I'm calling connectedness. And if you look at the student A star, when I hold down right click, all it does is it highlights all of the things with the same color. No, it doesn't do any of the path connectedness stuff, okay? So this does need to be changed. This is incorrect. For example, you cannot path find from right here to right here, even though the student code says that you can. All right, so those are the new things in this assignment. Let's have a look at my slides and we'll see exactly what we're getting ourselves into. Someone asked about another option. I'll get to that at the end of the lecture. All right, so here is assignment two, lecture number six, assignment two. We are going to be talking first about some grid pathfinding optimizations because assignment two is going to be all about, okay, assignment one looked at breadth first search and just sort of doing that naively. Now we're going to pile on a ton of optimizations that are specifically for grids and grid world searches in assignment two, and those will be part of your assignment. If you choose not to implement all of these optimizations, that's okay as long as you get the functionality working. However, if you want to be one of the fastest running assignments in the class, you are going to have to do these optimizations. So just like assignment one, once the assignment is marked, I'm going to be releasing the top three performing solutions in terms of runtime. So if you can get close or super or um, faster than the solution code, that will be great. But if you're not, that's okay. As long as each of your paths runs in under a second, then that's, that's all I'm really concerned about. So what's new in assignment two? Well, I talked about it a little bit. Let's have a look. We have the A star algorithm instead of BFS and DFS. We have multiple object sizes. We have eight directional movement as well as four directional movement. We have heuristic functions. We have connected sectors and we have pre-computing and optimization. So just to remind you, here is the A star search algorithm. And again, the only thing in A star that's different from breadth first search is when you go to remove something from the open list, you're removing the node from the open list with the minimum F cost. That's it. We talked about that all last time. BFS and A star. It, the funny thing is this is an algorithms course, but the actual search algorithm of A star you can almost copy and paste your solution from BFS and just change this to be remove min F instead of pop. And you'll, you'll be done the A star part. So there's a lot more going on in this assignment than just A star. Otherwise it would be very, very trivial assignment. So here um, I've taken this pseudocode and translated it into a little, something a little bit more that looks like JavaScript. This is not exact JavaScript. But inside your search iteration function, this is basically what you're going to be doing. So this is almost what you should have done already for assignment one, is something that looks like this, however, for BFS instead of A star. So I have just included um, this here for you as sort of a helper to what your search iteration function should look like in assignment two. And you should get the hint from this that if I'm giving you this much help with the search iteration function, that it's probably not the main focus of assignment two, is actually implementing the A star. The main focus of assignment two is going to be in all the other cool stuff that we're going to do for the assignment. First, let's talk about the node class, because as we saw last time, when we're doing A star search, our node class stores a bunch of different variables. So our node class has a bunch of, has some new variables. Uh, in assignment one, it had the X and Y state of the node, the action that generated the node and the parent. For assignment two, we're going to have as well, the G cost of the node, that's the cost of the path so far, and the H cost of the node, which is the heuristic estimate of how far we have to go from the goal from the state that is represented by this node. So that's our H of M. So we're going to store H and we're going to store G inside the node class. And then just as a note, uh, the way we figure out the G cost for a node is we take the parent's G cost and then add the cost of the action that generated this node. 
again, we're going to be working in the same type of grid world environment. So we have X, Y states. Again, X goes, uh, increases to the right and Y increases downwards. And now we have eight possible actions. Okay, so before we only had four possible actions, up, down, left, and right. And now we've added the diagonals as well. So with diagonals, if we can see here, you know, moving in a diagonal, is a little bit further than moving up, down, left, or right. And so our action costs have changed a little bit as well. Whereas before we had up, down, left, and right just being 100 each, now we have the diagonals costing 141. And if you want to know, okay, these seem kind of arbitrary. Well, what I've done here is, as I mentioned before, moving up, down, left, or right, they're just sort of one, so one distance, right? We're going to the next grid. However, moving up, right, or up left or any diagonal, instead of just moving one, you're actually moving the square root of two, right? We use Pythagoras, we go one over, one up, the distance is the square root of one plus one, and so that is the square root of two. So in order to not use floating point values, because the float, you know, square root of two is irrational, it goes on forever, I'm just multiplying those values by a hundred and rounding them off. So a uh, distance of one is a cost of a hundred, and a distance of root two is a cost of 141. So that's why we have 141. We have, with new actions, come new legality restraints, okay? So before, we had only up, down, left, and right. And when we talked about what a legal action was, it was just saying, okay, you can, you can move up, down, left, or right. You cannot move off of the map, and you can't move to a tile of a different color. There are going to be extra constraints when we talk about um, diagonal movements in this assignment. So, what are, the, what are legal actions? An object can only occupy a region if all of the tiles underneath are the same color. So I'm going to read these out and then we'll go through examples. Because now we have object sizes as well. So an object is going to occupy multiple tiles. So that means in order for a, an, an object to legally be able to be at a specific tile, all of the tiles that it occupies have to be the same color. An object can only move to a space if all of the new region is the same color as well. So you're not just checking one location this time, you're checking multiple locations to see if they're all the same color. An object must be entirely within the map. So that means like if your object is of size three, you can't be all the way over to the side of the map because then it would be overlapping the edge of the map. And the last and most annoying one is that a diagonal move cannot allow the object to jump over a tile of another color. And I'll explain what that is. So I'll give examples of all of these now, um, illustrated examples, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. The first is object sizes. So in assignment one, all we had was an object that was occupying a single grid cell. So we didn't have to worry about sizes. In this assignment, we have objects of different sizes. So an object of size one, the X, Y location of that object just represents where it is, right? It's only one cell, so it's the cell that it's in. When we get to an object of size two, the X, Y location of that object represents the top left cell of that object. Okay, so it represents the top left cell and it is going to occupy that cell, the cell to its right, the cell below it, and the cell to the bottom right. So a two by two object occupies four grid cells and they have to all be the same color in order for the object to be able to be at that spot. Similarly, an object of size three um, occupies the, the X, Y location of that object is the top left cell and it occupies all nine cells, two to the right and two down, all right? So that is an object of different sizes. We could keep going with different object sizes and make it arbitrary, but for this assignment, we are stopping with object size three. So we have objects of size one, size two, and size three. Whether or not an object can fit at a location, and I have a function that is can fit, and an object can fit at a location if all of the tiles that it occupies are the same color, okay? So, and this object right here, this three by three object can fit at this location. However, this three by three object 
cannot fit at this location because it would be occupying both blue and green cells. So hopefully that's, that's pretty intuitive. So what you would have to do in order to check to see if an object can fit, you take its size, right? So an object of size three, you would have to check the current XY location um, and all of the others within this three by three grid to see if they all have the same value. And if they all have the same value, then yes, it can fit. And if they don't, if even one of them is a different value, then you cannot fit at that location. So that is where objects can go. Now let's talk about legal actions. So in assignment one, we had uh, up, down, left, and right as legal actions. So for example, from here, you could go up, you could go right, you could go down, but you could not go left because left would be going into a tile of a different color. There are extra qualifiers on legal actions for this assignment because now we have diagonal actions. So we can go up, we can go right, we can go down. We can't go left because it's, it's the same rule as assignment one. However, now we also have diagonals. So what I want you to, so we can go upright because there's nothing blocking. We can go down right, there's nothing blocking. We can't go down left because it's a different color, but we also can't go up left. Even though up left is the same color as this tile, I'll show you what I mean. So what I want you to envision is picture that these were like actual physical tiles on a on a board, right? Like on your tabletop. A, an action is legal if you could slide it from its current location to its goal location. So picture we take this tile and we slide it up left. If we could slide it up left without touching another color, then it's a legal action. So for example, over here on this side, um, oops. Over here on this side, we could slide this tile upright because it would only be touching blue tiles on the way there. So the current tile is blue, the two it would slide over are blue, and this one is blue. However, I can't go up left because it would be sliding over this green tile. So what we're saying is diagonal moves cannot jump over corners like this. And that is true for all of the tiles in the object. So for example, down here, if my object is a two by two object, um, right here, okay, it's at this location, the top left, it occupies a four by four area, uh, sorry, a two by two area, so four grid cells. What, what actions are legal from this location? Well, I could move to the left, right? Because all, like both of these tiles are the same color as these tiles. I could not move up because if I moved up, then one of these tiles would be overlapping, right? So that is not, so moving up is not legal. I can't move up right because again, it would be different colored tiles. I cannot move to the right because if I move to the right, then this tile would be overlapping this one and it's a different color. I can move down because down both of these are blue, right? I can move down left, see that? So if I move down left, then I would only be sliding over blue tiles. However, I cannot move up left. And the reason I can't move up left is because if I take this piece as a single object and try and slide it up, I would be jumping over that green corner. See how that works? So I can't do that. And so I can't move down right because similarly, I would be jumping over this corner, right? So, so that's how this works. You can, no part of your object, if it's size one by one, two by two, three by three, no part of your object can jump over a tile of a different color. So that is what you're gonna to have to look out for in your is legal action function. Alrighty, so that means that if you have an object, let's say you have an object of size two by two living right here at your start and an object or a goal location up here. So our goal is to move this object to that goal. Even though this pathway is two by two right here, I cannot move up here. 
I have to go around. Because if I did try and move diagonally, even though this spot right here is all blue tiles, if I tried to move like this, I would be jumping over a green tile and I'm not allowed to do that. Okay, so this, in order to, to move, I would have to go all the way over here, then all the way up, then all the way over, and then down like that. Okay, so that would have to be the legal path here. If I increase the space that I have here, then now I can move through this sort of column right here, or this, this like pathway right here, but I still cannot move diagonally. All right, the reason is that if I try and move diagonally right here, even though this part is not jumping over anything, this part right here would be jumping over it. Okay, so in order to move from the start to the goal, I would have to go up, right, up, right, up, right, up, like that. That's how I would have to move there. So just keep in mind that it may look a little weird, but there's a really cool property of this that, and it's sort of like a real life pathfinding, right? I can't jump, well, I mean, okay, in the real world I could jump over, but I'm picturing that this is like a planar problem, so I can't jump over things in this sort of real pathfinding problem. However, it does have a really nice interesting fact, and you can use this, you might be already thinking to yourself, oh my god, how am I going to implement this? Like, I'm sliding, like, how do I... How do I tell if I'm jumping over another tile of a different... Uh, it's it's kind of tricky <laughs> to program that, right? Like, how would I think about programming that? Ah, there's a shortcut. There's a little optimization. So, if we look at diagonal movement. So, for example, in this, in this case, I can move diagonal upright. I can move diagonal downright. I cannot move diagonal up right, I cannot move diagonal down left. Sorry, diagonal up left and diagonal down left are the illegal ones. It turns out that there's a really cool feature that by introducing this um, property of not being able to jump over stuff, here's the cool thing. So if the two cardinal, so cardinal means up, down, left, and right, if the two cardinal actions surrounding the diagonal action are both true, then the diagonal action is true. And if any of the cardinal actions surrounding the diagonal action are false, that means the, the diagonal action is false. Okay? And why is that? It's because, if I go back here, in order for me to be able to slide up from here to here, I must have been able to go... So if I want to go up left, it means that up then left must have been legal, as well as left then up must have been legal. See how that works? So I can tell whether or not a diagonal is legal by its component-wise cardinal actions. So I don't need to specifically compute diagonal um, diagonal movability. I just need to say whether or not, okay, if up right, if I'm trying to compute if up right is legal, then up and right and right then up must both be legal, okay? And here, down left is not legal because going left then down is not legal. So that's a really cool property that we can use to help us with that computation. Here, in the same, um, this one, where at first it might look like you can go diagonally, the reason we can't go upright, okay, so we cannot do this upright action. Well, up then right is legal, but right then up is not legal, because if you went right, then this one would be overlapping this tile. Okay, so that's the le the action legality. That is everything you need to know about an action being legal. And one last thing, I guess, is that if you have a two by two object specified, um, let's say I have a two by two object specified right here. Um, this is not a legal place for that object to be because a two by two object would then be overlapping the edge of the map. 
So you have your object has to be completely contained within the bounds of the map. Now we move on to paths. So paths in this environment, um, what would a legal path be? Well, a legal path is a ordered sequence of legal actions. So for example, even though it might initially look like it, this is not a legal path, okay? So if this is our environment, even though these tiles are all blue, you cannot make this path because this jumping over this green one right here is not a legal action. I apologize to people who may um, not be able to distinguish between red and green, but this is green right here, this is red right here, and you would be jumping over um, like this. So this is not a legal path. However, this is a legal path because this diagonal action is not jumping over any colors that are different than the one that is currently on. And the path cost, so in assignment one, your path cost was just the length of the path times 100. Remember that? Because all of our action costs were 100. So in order to figure out what the cost of the path is, you just multiply it by 100. But now you have to use the G cost, right? So the G value in the node is the cost um, of the path so far. So here we have the starting state. So the G cost of the, start st of the node of the starting state would be zero because we haven't gone anywhere yet. And then if we do an action to the right, then that's cost 100. So we would take the G cost of the parent, we would add 100 to that to form 100. Then we would add 100, 100, 100, 100. And then when we make this diagonal action, we add 141 because that is the cost of the diagonal action. And we would add that to the G cost of its parent and we would get 741, then we would add this, okay? So we have to make sure now that we can't just multiply by the length of the path, we have to keep track of that G cost. Perfect, so now you know all about actions, you know all about costs. One of the new things, and another new thing in this assignment is the heuristic function. So the heuristic function is essentially, we talked about it, it's the guess at how much distance is remaining between a current, the state of a current node and the goal state. So in this assignment, in action, in assignment two, we have a function called estimate cost. Estimate cost takes in a starting X and a starting Y. Well, sorry, it's not the starting state. It's a current X and a current Y. And it takes in a goal X and a goal Y. And you have to compute four different heuristic functions. So one of them is the Euclidean two-dimensional distance. So you just implement Pythagoras on these two X and Ys. There is the curd. So curd means cardinal Manhattan distance. Diag is the diagonal Manhattan distance and zero just re literally returns zero. I will get, I will, I will show you this function when we get to the code. So after I give all of these slides, I'm going to go to the code of the assignment and show you where you implement all of this. So don't worry about that just yet. So here is the, um, the heuristic function. Let's say that we want to compute the um, heuristic function evaluation between some current x, y location of a node and some goal x and y location. So the Euclidean distance would be the straight line x, y distance between these two things. So you would do the square root of the, squ of the sum of the square of the differences, right? So that's just Pythagoras. The cardinal Manhattan distance, what you do to do this one is you figure out this path length, okay? And of course you would multiply that by a hundred. Um, so in this case, what you do, it's very easy. You have a uh, X, Y here, and you have an X, Y here. So if you just subtract this X from this X and take the absolute difference. So it's essentially the difference in the X's, okay? Plus the difference in the Y's, that's it. That, that's, the, that's the Manhattan distance. It's the difference in the X's plus the difference in the Y's. The diagonal Manhattan distance, on the other hand, is a little bit more tricky, okay? Um, you have to be able to compute this diagonal path. So my hint for computing the diagonal Manhattan distance is the following. You compute the difference in the X and you compute the difference in the Y. All right, so now that you have the difference in the X and you have the difference in the Y, 
you can see that one of them is gonna be smaller, right? So let me draw a square around the smaller one. So the X distance is smaller than the Y distance. So what we want to do is take as many diagonal moves as the smallest of the X distance or the Y distance. So we compute, okay, the difference in the X, the difference in the Ys. We multiply the cost of a diagonal action by the X difference. And then we take the, diff the Y difference minus the smaller X distance and multiply that by the cost of a cardinal action, okay? So I'm not gonna write that code for you because this is part of the assignment, but this is the way that I figured out um, how to do the, um, the diagonal Manhattan distance. And someone asked, are the heuristics allowed to jump over? So that's a, it's a good question, but it it's, should be framed a little bit differently because the heuristic knows nothing about any obstacles right? The heuristic is a guess. And so, for example, just like the, 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 oh, just like the Euclidean distance is jumping over everything because it doesn't know about objects, so is the Manhattan distance and so is the diagonal Manhattan distance. The computation of your heuristics doesn't know anything about the actual environment and where objects might be. It's saying, what is the shortest possible diagonal distance to the goal? What is the shortest possible L-shaped distance to the goal? And what is the, um, the shortest possible path to the goal? Like this, right? Not including any obstacles. This is not using any jump over rules or anything like that. You're just drawing this. And the zero heuristic literally just always returns zero. So where you see the zero heuristic, you just return zero. Okay, so a little quiz, a pop quiz for people in the chat who are paying attention. If I do A star with a zero heuristic, what algorithm that we've covered is that equivalent to? I'm just going to wait for like 10 seconds to see if anyone can, can answer it. A star with a zero heuristic is equivalent to what? Well, A star F of N equals G of N plus H of N. So if H of N is zero, F of N equals G of N, and which algorithm has F of N equal to G of N? That's uniform cost search, okay? So good exam question, good exam question. All right, now that we have talked about heuristics, let's talk about the next um, new thing in this assignment. Connected states. States are considered connected for an object of a given size if a legal path exists between them no matter how long that path might be. So essentially a co two connected states means is there a path between them? Can I get from one to the other in any way? So a connected sector is the entire set of states that are all connected to each other. So in assignment two, holding the right mouse button highlights all the states that are connected to the clicked state. And something that's maybe important for an optimization is that connectivity is transitive. So remember your math classes, the transitive property. If A is connected to B and B is connected to C, then A is connected to C. What does that mean? It means that just like in the real world, if you can get from A to B and you can get from B to C, that means you can get from A to C, right? That's the transitive property. So connectivity is transitive. So keep that in mind for any optimiz optimizations you may do. Let's look at thing, let's look at some con connectivity here. So which states here are connected? Let's look at two states, this state and this state they are connected, right? Because a path exists between one state to the, to the other state. Perfect, they are connected. So these three are connected for size one, meaning that for an object of size one, I can get from A to B, I can get from B to C, I can get from A to C, okay? So they are all connected for size one. They would all be considered in the same connected sector. 
They are not connected for size two or size three. Why not? Well, because B is not, this is not a legal position for an object of size two or size three. So since B and C would not be able to actually live at that position, right? Because they would be overlapping either the edge of the map or overlapping a tile of a different color, then they are not considered to be connected. These three spots are connected for an object of size two because I could fit an object of size two right here and I could fit an object of size two right here and there is a path from A to C for an object of size two and there is a path from A to B with an object of size two and because I can go from A to C and A to B there's also a path from B to C. However, it may not have to go through A. So for example, if I go C all the way down here, there's actually a separate path from A to C. So all of these are connected for size two. However, they are not connected for size three. So even though an object of size three can live over here, and an object of size three can be placed over here, and an object of size three can be placed over here, there is no way for my object to get out of here to get to C, or get out of here to go to A. So these are not connected for size three, okay? Similarly, two states are not connected if they're on different colors, right? Because there's no path between the two different colors, so they are not connected. So that means that a connected sector is a set of all states that is connected to, a, to each other. So for example here, all of these yellow, all of these green states are connected to each other for an object of size one. Um, so these blue ones for an object of size one, they're all connected. For these, they're all connected, but for other sizes, they may not be connected. How do we compute connectivity? So you might think, okay, this is gonna be like a crazy expensive computation because I'm going to have to loop over every spot on the map. And for every spot on the map, I have to do pathfinding to every other spot on the map to see whether or not I can actually get to that other spot. So I've got like an N squared amount of pathfinding going on and that's going to take a super, super long time. It turns out, that there's a cool algorithm, well, there's a cool way we can do um, connectedness in this environment given the properties that we have set up. So commuting connectivity. Remember what I said about a diagonal move is only legal if both surrounding cardinal actions are also legal. So a diagonal move is only legal if there is at least one path, well, actually, if there's two paths using up, down, left, and right. So a diagonal path is only legal if there exists an up, down, left, right path that could also get us there. So the fact that we have diagonal moves does not help us get some, this, it doesn't help us get to anywhere that wasn't possible with up, down, left, right movements. It only helps us get there faster. And connectivity doesn't care about how fast you are. It just cares that a path is possible. So this means that a path with diagonal moves only exists if another path with only cardinal actions also exists. And we'll explain, we explain that in the optimization section. Therefore, cardinal connectivity is the same as diagonal connectivity and cardinal connectivity is easier to compute and we can actually compute it using breadth first search, right? So look at this. If I come back here and I want to know, okay, which states are connected to this one? The idea, actually, let me use this one down here because my face is covering that up a bit. The idea is that if I do a breadth first search outward from this location, only taking legal actions with cardinal movements, right? Then this eventually is going to get me to all the states that are legal from this state. So if I do a breadth first search, I can compute connectivity from a starting state. 
It's really interesting. I'll show you the algorithm now. So the way we are going to compute our sectors is as follows. The first, and this is an illustration of the algorithm. I am going to list the algorithm later. I'm not going to list the exact algorithm because I don't want to do the assignment for you, but I'm going to show you in pictures and then I'll show you in pseudocode. Okay. So here we are going to start, we're going to do a BFS from every point on the map. So we're going to first iterate over every location in the map. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start in the top left and then I'm going to go to the right. Then I'm going to come down here at the second row and I'm going to go to the right. Third row, go to the right. Fourth row, go to the right. So I would this loop would be like for y equals zero because I'm starting on the top row, uh, y less than height, y plus plus. Then in the inner loop would be for x equals zero, x less than width, x plus plus. So I am visiting every single spot on the map. Now, all of these are going to be initially given a value of zero. And zero means that this spot is not connected to any other place on the map, okay? That's what zero is going to mean. They all start as zero and we are going to change the zeros as we go. But if we end up with any zeros, it means that that spot is not connected to anywhere else on the map. So starting up here, what I'm going to do is increase the number and I'll go to one. So I go from zero to one and I'm going to check first, can my object fit at that location? And is it already something that's not zero? Because if it's already something that's not zero, then I've already visited this, this spot. And if I can't fit there, then it's not connected to anything. So it should stay zero. So look, a one by one object can fit here. And the, and the, the value is a zero. So I'm going to fill it in as a one. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a breadth first search out from this location, doing legal up, down, left, and right actions. And I will set everything that I can touch equal to a one. So the first step of the BFS will go out from those, from this state to these two states, setting them to a one. Then as breadth first search does, it goes to its neighbors and those neighbors and those neighbors. And eventually everything that I could touch from this state is going to be given a value of one. So look at this in one breadth first search. What I've done is I've computed and marked every single state on the map that is connected to this spot. And not only that, but since all of those are connected to this spot, then because of transitivity, they're all connected to each other. So that means after that one BFS, anything in this grid, I'm calling this my connected sectors grid. So my connect or a connected sectors map, anything in this map that has a value of zero is not connected to anything. And anything that has the, uh, the same value is connected to anything else with that same value. So now what I do is now that I have finished a BFS, I'm going, so I, I just finished my BFS from right here. Now I'm going to do a BFS from right here, but look, I've already given that a value of one. And if I've already given it a value of one, it means I've already computed its connectivity. So if this value isn't a zero, then I've already computed it so I can skip it. So now I go here and look, this one is a one so I can skip it. And I go all the way across to this one. So this now is where I'm going to start my breadth first search. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it a value of two. Whenever I find a new spot that I can start a BFS, I increase the number by one. So then I do a BFS out from right here and I find, hey, look, all of these sectors now have a value of two. So they are all connected to each other. Then what I do is I continue. So now I try right here and I say, oh, it already has a non-zero value. So I don't need to BFS from there 
because it's already been done. So now I check these two, then I go to the next line, I'm checking, I'm checking, I'm checking, all of these are non-zero, checking, 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 now I get to another zero. So if it's a zero, then I'm gonna set it to my previous value plus one, I do a BFS out from there, and now I've computed all of these connected sectors. Then I keep going and going because I don't have any more zeros until I find a new zero, and I do the same thing here. And what I'm left with after I run this pretty neat series of breadth first searches is a grid which holds the connectivity for the entire map. And I've only had to do, I've only basically had to touch each grid cell once, maybe twice if you think about it. But I haven't had to do a series of pathfinding things between every possible location on the map because of the transitivity of connectivity. Okay, so that's like, the first time I saw this, this like blew my mind, right? So I know if I want to know, hey, is there a path possible between right here and right here? All I need to do is check to see if those two are the same number. If they're the same number and they're not zero, then a path exists between them. Done. Now, I don't know the optimal path length, but I do know that a path exists between them, and that gives me lots of cool information. So here is the algorithm that I just described, but this is in code now instead of, oh geez, excuse me. That's in code now instead of uh, visual. So here we go. I'm calling this compute sectors. It's also called compute sectors in your uh, assignment. I'm going to say that sect uh, sectors equals grid map width map height zero. Now, what I've done here is I've set up a two-dimensional array. You're going to have to do this on your own in the assignment. You're gonna to have to set up a two-dimensional array and set all of those values equal to zero. And so this sectors, that is the grid that stores all those numbers. So the grid that stores all these numbers, that is that sectors variable. And here, this is pseudocode, this is not JavaScript. I'm just saying set up a two-dimensional array that has this, this width and this height and set them all to zeros. Set my initial sector number equal to zero. That is the number that I want to start placing in the map. So I had a one there, then I had a two, then I had a three. That is the sector number. Then I can iterate through my sectors in any way that I want. I could go row first or column first. That's fine, doesn't really matter. And I'm going to say if sectors x, y is not equal to zero, right? This means that if I have already given it a value or the object can't fit there, continue. And actually, um, I do need to, I do need to fix this slide. Do, do, do. If the object of a given size cannot fit there, continue, right? So this is what I was doing. I was saying, if it's not a zero, skip it. If I can't fit there, skip it. Otherwise, I can start a new BFS there. So I increase my sector number, right? Because it was zero, now it's gonna be one. If it was one, now it's gonna be two. And then I'm calling this cardinal BFS function, which is going to do a BFS starting at x, y. It's going to be searching in four directions, and for any legal action up, down, left, or right, it's going to be setting that sector number. And remember, when I BFS, it has to be a zero value and it has to be a legal action. So then later on, once I finish this, I'm left with that um, connected sector map, or this sectors grid that I'm calling it. So now what I want to do, if I ever want to call is connected, right? So I call is connected. Are these two things connected? I can just say if the sector value for the first location is the same as the sector value for the second location, then they're connected. Now I would also have to put check to see if there's zero here, but you get what I'm saying. If I want to know if a path is possible between two locations, I just have to query this map. Can you imagine how, how powerful that would be for like a video game? Just your, your AI might want to know, hey, can I reach the player? And now you can do it in constant time. You don't even need to look up the path at first. So 
we're going to use this to say, hey, is a path possible? If it's not, then don't even bother trying to search for a path. Okay, so someone asked, would computing sectors work the same for non one object sizes or does it not matter? I will show you in a bit, but yes, it does work the same for non one object sizes. However, we just need to be careful when we do our legal action computation, right? Because we can't BFS from here to here, right? Or we can't BFS from here to here for an object of size two because we would be overlapping. So it's the exact same um, legal actions up, down, left, and right. It's just for sizes larger than one, you have to be aware of like not overlapping part of the tile. So two tiles are connected if their pre-computed sector number is the same and it's not zero. We can use this as a pre-check to see if a path is possible before computing it. So if the start and goal are not connected, then no path can exist between them. And some people were asking me, like my solution for assignment one seemed to not do a search if a path wasn't possible. And so this is how it was able to do that is because under the under the hood, it was doing this um, connectivity computation. And so if you have my solution code and you clicked somewhere where there were no path was possible, it didn't do any search at all. It had no open list, no closed list because it knew that no path was possible. So let's look at bigger object sizes now, which was the question that I had from the chat. So let's say that I want to compute connectivity for an object of size three at this location. So just keep in mind that the location here in the connectivity grid is for the object of a given size whose top left corner is marked by the X. So this location is connected to that location. Let's do that again. This location is an object of size three by three that can entirely fit. I can move to the right because all of these spots are blue. So that is connected. However, this is not connected. Okay. This is not connected because it is not legal for the object of size three by three to live at this location. So if I do, for example, if I look at this map and I try and see all the different places where an object of size three can fit, well, there's only a few locations on this map where an object of size three could fit. So these are the only locations that I would actually be doing that BFS. So if I look at this BFS for an object of size three, it would end up looking something like this. So I'm going to do my BFS outward from right here, but now keep in mind when I'm doing this BFS, it's for an object of size three and the number designates the top left corner of that object. So if I go, okay, I can BFS down and I can BFS to the right. I can BFS all of these neighbors, but I cannot move from here to here, right? This is not a legal action because that three by three object would be overlapping this green tile right here. So the BFS here has to be aware of legal actions for object of size three by three. So if I keep going here, then what I will end up having is this connected sector map. And this is really interesting because it lets me know that for an object of size three, hey, this spot is connected to this spot. It lets me know that this spot is connected to this spot. But even cooler is that it lets me know that this spot here, an object of size three can't even be placed there because if it could, it would have a non-zero sector number. So later on, when you go to optimize your code and you want to say, okay, can an object of size three fit here? You can just check to see if your sector number is zero. And then you don't have to check all nine locations because you did that check in this pre-computation phase of the computed sectors. All right, so that's basically all you need to know about assignment three or assignment two. However, let's talk about some speed optimizations. I love speed optimizations.
So the following optimization will not affect the number of nodes that you generate, okay? So the algorithmic properties of the A star algorithm will not be affected by these optimizations. They are just for computation speed, not big O um, complexity. So none of these optimizations will be required for getting full marks on the assignment. However, some of these optimizations may be required to get smooth paths while dragging the mouse. What do I mean by that? Let's have a look at what I mean by that. So if I go back over here to the assignment and I set solution, let's say I go to like these dense caves over here, right? If I have an object of size three by three and I'm up here and I click and drag, um, let's see. Let's just do an object of size one by one. So if I'm clicking and dragging here and, and dragging around like this, you see how it's kind of smooth, right? I'm computing these paths in real time. It's pretty smooth. Now it turns out that Firefox is like 10 times slower than Chrome. So by all means, do this in Chrome if you want to. However, this is running this fast because of the optimizations that I'm about to tell you. And if you, if you do not do these optimizations, your paths may take up to like 50 times longer to compute. So if you want any chance at being the fastest solution in the class, you will have to compute some of these optimizations. All right, let's go back to the PowerPoint. All right, connected sector optimization. I've already talked about this one, but I wanted to have a slide on it as well. For, so for larger object sizes, we may have some tiles that have a zero value. This means that the object cannot fit at all at that part of the map. So by pre-computing those values, we can use them later instead of doing a full object size check to see if the underlying tiles have the same value. What does that mean? It means that, well, if I wanted to know if an object of size three by three could, for example, fit right here, then naively, what I would have to do is say, okay, uh, the top left corner is blue. So what I need to do is I need to check this cell, 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 and this cell, and see if they are all blue. But if I do have this computed sector check, all I need to do is see if this is zero. That's it. So it's nine times faster. It's actually a bit more than nine times faster if we use this optimization. Okay, doke. That's one optimization. The next one is legal action optimizations. So the rule of no jumping over diagonals actually gives us a really interesting property. We talked about that. And that was a diagonal move of XY, meaning for example, up left, uh, is only legal if both X then Y and Y then X are legal as well. So that project, that property holds for all object sizes. So, that means if I want to know, if I want to compute whether or not this diagonal is legal, all I have to do is check to see if this one and this one are legal. And I'm done. That's my, that's my optimization. So I talked about that one already, uh, and I talked about this example already. So the most called function in assignment two is probably going to be the is legal action. And it's called when every child node is generated because I'm gonna want for every new node, I have to check for all eight legal actions, which of those actions is legal. So I'm gonna check the action, I'm gonna compute the next state, I'm gonna see whether or not it's legal. However, we can use the pre-computed connectivity sectors to check for legal cardinal actions. Since actions are legal only if the source and destination are connected. So connectivity gives us legality as well, which is really, really cool. So how do I, what do I mean by this? So if I have four locations, A, B, C, and D, the legal action of going from A to D is legal only if A, B, B, D, A, C, and C, D are also legal, right? So if A, B, right? A, B is legal if I can move to the right. 
AC is legal if I can move down. So only if AC then CD and AB then BD are legal is AD a legal action. So AB is only legal if A and B are connected, right? Because if A and B are connected and they're right next to each other, then that means I can move from one to the other. And that's, that's the same for all cardinal actions. So AB, BD, AC, and CD are legal if A, B, C, and D are all connected. So that means if A, B, C, and D are all connected, then AD is legal. That's really cool. Like, I, I want you to sit down and like maybe draw an example on, on paper about that and, and really understand how that works because it is such a crazy cool optimization that you can do for this assignment. And connectivity is transitive. So if AB and BD are connected, that means that AD is connected. So if AB, AC, and AD are connected, then AD is legal. So if you ever wanna check if action AD is legal, all you have to do is see are A and B connected, are A and C connected, and are A and D connected. And if they are, then AD is a legal action. Really easy. Here's an even crazier legal action optimization. Our environment is static. So tiles are going to have the same legal actions every time you visit them, no matter what. So you could just pre-compute all the legal actions for all tiles, and then later iterate over the list of legal actions rather than trying to generate them. And this will result in a lot of time saved. So what do I mean by that? So if I, for example, here we go. Let's pre-compute the legal actions for each tile. So if I'm here, my only legal action from here, this is a blue tile, this is a green tile, would be to move down, right? So in my pre-computation step, I could compute all the legal actions. So I could say, check all eight actions, see which ones are legal, and just store the ones that are legal. Okay, so I store the ones that are legal. So down here, um, I can say, okay, what are the legal actions from here? Well, I can move up, I can move right, I can move down, and I can move down right. So I know the legal actions from this state and my environment will not change. So I know that those will be legal forever. Similarly from here, I could move left, I can move right, I can't move up, I can't move up left, I can't move up right, but I can move down, I can move bottom left, I can move bottom right. And so if you store those, then you'll never have to compute legal actions again because you know which actions are legal. Okay, optimization number three, a closed list optimization. So if you think about it, your closed list is going to store unique states because once you visit a state, you add it to the closed list and you'll never visit that state again. So you'll never add it to the closed list again. So the uniqueness of existence in the closed list means you can do a really cool optimization with the closed list. So each state on the map will either be in the closed list or not on the, in the closed list. So for example, naively, what you could do is you could store the closed list as an array of states. Right? And every time you want to check to see if something is in the closed list, you'll take that XY location and you will iterate over the closed list and you'll see, is that XY location in the closed list? However, that is a linear time operation on the size of the closed list. So what you could do is use a map. And a, a one way of implementing a map is a 2D array. So instead of having a list for the closed list, you could store a 2D array of true or false values, the same size as the map. And what that does is denote whether or not the state is in the closed list. And so if you do that, then you can query closed list membership in constant time. So you no longer have to traverse the closed list to see if the thing is in the closed list. You can just do a lookup table to say, hey, is this in the closed list? Instantly.
So that'll make that a lot faster as well. Next, I have an open list optimization. So what I recommend for your assignment is to use an array as we've been doing for the open list. And then we iterate through the open list to find the minimum F value. However, what I said in the class was that you can use a priority queue data structure. So if you want, in the assignment, I have included for you a binary heap data structure, and that will be much faster than doing the naive traversal through an array. But please, before you start, uh, uh, this is very, 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 very important. Before you start doing any of these optimizations, sorry, I, I went too far. Before you start doing any of these, okay. Before you start doing any optimizations, get the assignment to work first. Very important. It's very important. Do not start with the optimizations. Get it to work, get full marks, and then worry about the optimizations. Okay, so let's go back. Um, I have the assignment file. So if we go back to the assignment and we reload, again, just like assignment one, you have some user interface, you have your student code, and you have your solution code. So all that stuff has already been explained for you in assignment one. The only difference is you right click to compute connectivity. That's it. So all I really have to show you for this assignment is the search student code, because it's gonna be the exact same thing as assignment one. However, I have included a binary heap here for you. So if you want to use that binary heap as a priority queue, you totally can, but I am not going to provide you with any help for that. You have to figure that out sort of on your own, okay? Um, you have the grid, the grid is the same as before. The grid GUI, that's the same as before. This is just user interface code. You don't need to worry about that. Um, more user interface code, don't worry about that. This is the HTML page, don't worry about that. You have the obfuscated solution code, don't worry about that. The only thing you have to worry about is search student.js. There is a lot more in this than there was in assignment one. So I'm gonna go over this with you and we're gonna read it together so that you are 100% sure of what you have to do in this assignment. Uh, here we go. So I'm just gonna read through all of this and then we'll be done for the lecture. But I, I wanted to go through all of it rather than just giving you this and say, good luck. I want to go through this code to show you where you're going to have to make edits in this code. But it is going to be almost identical to assignment one. Alrighty. So all of your assignment code should be in this file. It is the only file submitted. You may create additional functions or member variables within the class, but do not rename any of the existing variables or function names since they are used by the GUI to perform specific functions. So that is the exact same as assignment one. Here is the difference. I have given you a recommended order of completing this assignment. Now, here is something very important as well. What has happened in the past, and this is no fault of any student, in fact, it is a failing of our first and second year courses, is that what some people have done in the past is I have given a series of eight steps that you should use. Um, this is the order in which you should do things for this assignment. What some people do is they do step one, then they do step two, then three, then four, then five, then six. They program it all and then they go over to their assignment and for the very first time, they try and run it and it doesn't work. And if you do that, any of these eight steps could have been the problem. The reason I've listed these eight steps in this order is because you should be able to do these steps in this order and after you have completed step one, you go over here and you test to see if step one worked. If it doesn't work, you know exactly where the error is. Next, complete step two. If step two doesn't work, 
Well, you know that step one works, so you know that your error is in step two. Then you do step three, then you do step four, and you only move on to the next step after all of the previous steps are working. Please, please do that, because I have had so many students over the years who have not done this sort of iterated development, because this is a pretty large assignment, I'm not gonna lie. None of it is overly complicated, but there are a lot of steps, right? It's a lot of programming, but the programming itself isn't complicated. However, if you have not done a sort of medium-sized project like this before, then you might be tempted to just start writing your whole book, and then once your whole book is written, you send it to the editor, right? Don't do that. Do step one, test it. Do step two, test it. Do step three, test it. It's very, 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 very important to do it that way. Hopefully you will be coding like that for the rest of your programming careers. You will be testing. You will be doing something and testing it, then moving on to the next thing, doing it and testing it, etc. So for the more experienced programmers out there, that may seem very intuitive, but keep in mind that our students are learning and you may not have done something of this magnitude before, and so you may just have tried to type it all and just hope that it works. Alrighty. So, what do you have to do in order to get this assignment to work? First, and I'm gonna go through each step, and before I go to the next step, I'm gonna show you the function in which you will actually be editing this code. So the first step is to construct the function which computes whether a given size agent can fit in a given x, y. This will be used by the compute sectors and is legal actions. So down here, we are going to have can fit. So here is the can fit function. In fact, let me move that up to the top because it's the first thing that you should do. So can fit, alrighty. This function should return whether or not an object of a given size can fit at the given x, y location. An object can fit if the following are true. If the object lies entirely within the bounds of the map and all tiles occupied by the object have the same grid value. The input variables are x and y, which are the integer state location of the object, and the size, this is the square length, the square side length of the size of the agent. So in here, what you will do is you will go through, iterate over the size of the object and check to see if all of those things are the same. And remember, over here we have the this.grid, um, yeah, this.grid object, and grid has two functions, which is get, so that will allow you to get the value of the grid, and is out of bounds will take your size now, so you have to make sure that it's out of bounds or not first. So that is the very first thing you should do, and that is to um, do the can fit function. The second thing, complete the compute sectors algorithm using four directional breadth first search as shown in the class slides. Alrighty, so where is that? Compute sectors, compute sectors, right here. That, this is that function. So this function should compute and store the connected sectors as discussed in class. This function is called by the constructor of the object before it is returned. So if we go up here, let's look at the constructor of this object now to see what we're working with. So again, we have the this.config, right? That is the configuration. So we have the actions array and the action costs array. Um, we have the heuristic as well. So this is a new thing here. Someone just asked, are we allowed to use code we wrote for assignment one? You are, however, there's not a lot of it there, but yes, you can take that code and modify it for this assignment by all means. You're going to have to change it a lot, so it's not going to be plagiarism. Um, this dot grid, that's the grid. We have the same starting X and Y. However, now, we have this dot size, that is the size of the agent, and the max size is three. So that means that the maximum possible size we could have is three. We have um, whether or not the search is in progress, and this dot expanded, don't worry about that, that's just used by the user interface. This dot in progress, that is whether or not the search is in progress, we did this for assignment one. 
We have the path, we have the open, we have closed, and we have cost. All of these things are the same as assignment one. However, the first thing that gets done before the object even gets returned to the user interface is the compute sectors code is called. So that compute sectors code is right here. Let me move that up. So it'll be the second thing that you look at. So the second thing that you do is compute sectors. Alrighty. So that code, again, that's in the slides, computing connectivity. Here is the compute sectors code. The only thing that I don't have in that skeleton code that you might have to write a function for is this cardinal BFS. So you will have to write your own little BFS inside that compute sectors, all right? And that BFS will do the BFS that we showed for this example. So you might want to write your own function. You could actually do the BFS here if you want to. Just be very careful not to use the open or closed lists. That's, that's part of your A star search for that. Okay, so that's what you will do right there. Step number three, use the results of step two to complete the isConnected function and test it with the user interface. So the isConnected function, let me get that one. Here's the isConnected function. I'll put that right below compute sectors. Okay, so the isConnected function should return whether or not the two given locations are connected. Two locations are connected if a path is possible between them. For this assignment, keep in mind that 4D connectedness is equivalent to 8D connectedness because you cannot use a diagonal move to jump over a tile. We went through all of that. This is just a reminder. So here you are returning whether or not a, an object of a given size at a given location is connected at a other location. What I have done in here is I have only included some sample code and that sample code um, just highlights, it just says if it's the same color, it's true. If it's a different color, it's false, but that's obviously not correct. So you have to change this and this is right here. Um, the is connected function. Where is it? Yeah, this is the is connected function right here. So that's what you do. However, you may also want to add the zero check. And then once you've gotten up to step three, once step three is done, then you should be able to right click your map and you're getting computed connectedness working. All right. So that, that should be working at that point with none of the other things having been done yet. Do not move on with the assignment until you get that to work. Do not. Four, complete the is legal action function, which will be used by search iteration. Okay, next is is legal action. Do, do, do. Let me copy this and move it up so that you get it in the right order. So we did, there we go. So this function should compute and return whether the given action is able to be performed from a given X, Y location. Diagonal moves are only legal if both two-step cardinal moves are also legal. I, I give that, I, I talked about that at length in the assignment. Um, the input is X and Y and the size and the output uh, and the action as well. So that will be the X, Y of the action. And you return here whether or not it's true. So this is the same as assignment one, except now you have to do that additional check for whether or not the diagonals are legal. Pretty simple. That's step four. Step five, complete the start search function which is called before search iteration. So down here, um, start search is next. So you did start search last time. Whatever you need to put inside start search, do that. It's kind of the same as assignment one. However, you may have some other things there that you want to store. Um, uh, part five, Complete the get open and get closed functions, which will help you visualize and debug your algorithm. So down here, this is get open and get closed. That is the exact same thing you did last time. However, if you end up using the uh, included binary heap as your open list, you may run into some, you know, you have to figure out how to get your stuff from the open list there. Step seven, complete the search iteration 
using A star with a heuristic of zero. It should behave like UCS. What does that mean? So you come down here to your search iteration function and you can basically take your code from assignment one, copy and paste it into here and change it to be um, A star instead of BFS, okay? So just, you can do that, that's fine because it's going to look almost identical anyway if you typed it in. So again, the difference being that you are removing the minimum F value from the open list. So what I recommend is at first, just keep using an array for the open list. And when you want to remove something from the open list, iterate through the open list, find the minimum F value and, and remove that from the open list. And only after you've gotten it working with the basic array, then try the priority queue binary heap thing that I've given you. I want you to get all the marks before you get all the optimizations, okay? So you do search iteration and you do it with a heuristic of zero. So do not worry about the heuristics yet. You're gonna come over after you've done step seven, you're going to select student A star. I'm going to select solution A star just for now. And this is what should happen with your student A star you should be able to do, um, you, you select a heuristic of zero, you click here, you click here, and what you get should be exactly the same as the uniform cost search, all right? So the uniform cost search is equivalent to no heuristic for A star, okay? So that's how you test whether or not your A star algorithm is working. If it's working and you could come over here to say like sparse caves where it may give you a better visualization. So uniform cost search here is equivalent to A star with no heuristic. Nothing, literally nothing should change between um, A star and breadth first search, or sorry, A star and uh, uniform cost search. If one or two things slightly changes, it might, but as long as you get the exact same costs, that's what I'm more worried about, okay? So as long as you get the exact same cost, that's what I'm worried about. All right, so that's how you know that A star is working. And finally, you use the you do the estimate cost functions and use it with A star. So here, the estimate cost functions, this is um, very, very intuitive. It's all, like a lot of this code is already written for you. So it says, if this is the diagonal heuristic, return the diagonal heuristic as we computed it in the slides. If it's curd, then return the four directional Manhattan distance. If it's dist, then you are returning the 2D Euclidean distance using the um, Pythagorean formula. And if it's zero, you return zero and zero is already done for you. Okay, so you just have to do these three. This one is super easy. This one's a little bit harder. This one's a little bit trickier. And only after all of that, are you going to go back in and run your A star with some heuristics, okay? And then you're gonna click the run tests button and everything should work fine. And just, just to let you know, in this assignment, um, the student one is always the student one. So you don't have to click student, I believe, uh, to run tests. Yeah, so the, the student column always uses student and the uh, solution column always uses the solution. So you just be able to run tests no matter what you have selected and it'll tell you whether or not you're correct. And you run a bunch of random tests and if it's correct, then you're correct and you're gonna get most of your marks. Uh, all right, so let's see what else is in the instructions here. Uh, please remove these comments before submitting. If you did not get the functionality of the assignment to work properly, please explain here in a comment. The one other question that I had, which was a very, very good question, let me um, show you up here. It was this, what is, uh, when I have solution A star, there are different tie breakers. So if you have an open list and you have two different things with um, the same F value. So for example, if I wanna pathfind from here to here, there are different ways that I could implement my um, 
my F value selection. For example, if all I do is select the minimum F value, maybe I get an open list that looks like this. So I'm just looking through my open list and I pick the first one. That's it. It might look like the, like the closed list is a little bit random. Okay. So for example, if I do this, yeah, my closed list looks a little bit weird because it just happened to be, I'm choosing the, the one with the minimum F value. It might be good. It might be bad. Up here, what I've done is I've shown you that you can actually apply a tiebreaker to your F cost and that you, you, you can do in a number of different ways. But let's think about it. If F is equal to G plus H, then I could either tie break on the G cost or I could tie break on the H cost. Tie breaking on the G cost gives me something that looks like this. I expand 167 nodes, a ton of nodes. Why? Because if I tie break on the G cost, on minimum G cost, it means of all the things that are tied in the F value, choose the thing that's closest to the start location. <laughs> that might not be the best thing to do. What I might actually want to do is choose the thing that I think is closest to the goal location, right? So even though um, I'm still selecting the minimum F value, look, I've only expanded 24 nodes here as opposed to the almost 200 here. And that just gets worse and worse and worse with different, different values. So. Keep in mind that even if you have multiple tied F values, you may want to play around with this tiebreaker because it may give you um, different results in not, so the path cost will always be the same, okay? The cost will always be the same. The properties of the A star algorithm are always the same. However, you may expand a few fewer nodes if you tie break differently. And the last thing I wanna do is very quickly go over the marking scheme for the assignment. So we have 5% uh, for code style, modularity, readability, you know, keep the same coding style. Please try and make your code look a little bit nice. We have to mark it. 5% um, for start search, get open and get closed working properly. 5% for is legal action working properly. 40% for the A star search, uh, the A star pathfinding for size one working properly. 25% for size two and three working properly. Connectedness for size one working properly is 15% and connectedness for size two and three working properly is 5%. So what that means, and I will add this here, um, step zero, do all of this for size one only first before doing size two and three. So what does that mean? It means that let's ignore, when you start this assignment, ignore the size component completely and do the assignment ignoring size. Just imagine that everything is size one. Now, in the marking scheme, if I go back here, you'll see that if you sum up all of the points, so if you don't do size two or size three at all, you can still get 70% on this assignment. I'll be a little bit disappointed that you didn't try, but um, you know, size two and size three, you wanna get size one working first to pass the assignment and then do size two and size three. So in practice, what does that mean? Well, for example, if you ignore sizes two and three and you only do size one, then all you will need is a connected, a single connected sector map. If you want to do size two and size three, then you will need to store a connected sector map for size one, size two, and size three. So what that means is down here, instead of having sectors X, Y, or sectors grid map width, map height, you may actually want this to be a three dimensional array so that you can store one grid for size one, one grid for size two, one grid for size three. And then here, this would be sectors S, X, Y. Okay, so that you have grids for size one, two, and three. So please 
get size one working first. I mean, if you're confident with your ability to use 3D arrays and all that kind of stuff, that's fine. Start right with assign or start by implementing sizes two and three. But I would recommend um, if this is your first time really working with, you know, two and 3D arrays in JavaScript, do all of this for size one first before doing sizes two and sizes three because size one is worth most of the marks. But please, please, please try to do sizes two and three. I'll be super disappointed if, if people don't do that. Alrighty, so that's assignment two. I believe I have covered everything. If I haven't, I'll make an announcement. It's a lot of work. The assignment, so this is Thursday, September 22nd. This assignment will be available for download um, overnight okay so between midnight tonight and when you wake up tomorrow that is when this assignment will be released i don't want to have this assignment released before assignment one is due because it contains some possible solution code for assignment one but it will be like when you get up tomorrow assignment two will be there all righty thank you so much um, for tuning in get started on this assignment as soon as you can because you do not want to wait until the last minute for this one all right, see you in the next one.